On the 26th of July, 1956, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalizes the Suez Canal Company. This leads to a military conflict that has serious repercussions not only on the balance of power in the Middle East, but soon threatens to lead the world into World War III. This is the beginning of a Time Ghost chronological series about the Suez Crisis. I'm Indy Nidell. This prologue episode is about the backstory to the actual crisis, which happens in the fall of 1956, and that story involves every factor that will define the post-World War II world. The decline of European empires, the geopolitics of the Cold War, the rise of Arab nationalism, the creation of Israel and its conflict with the Arab world, global oil and financial markets, and more. In 1869, Egyptian and French investors open a canal across the Isthmus of Suez connecting the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. The canal is a modern wonder of engineering, opening the Mediterranean for shipping directly to and from the Indian Ocean and shortening the journey from the Arabian Sea to London by close to 9,000 kilometers. The canal itself is 193.3 kilometers long and takes 10 years to build, but it is a source of political and economic strife from the start. In 1875, Britain acquires 44% of the shares of the Suez Canal Company from the Khedive of Egypt, who has serious financial woes. France still owns the majority of shares, however. Now, even though Egypt is nominally part of the Ottoman Empire, Britain invades in 1882 to help the new Khedive suppress a revolt and to secure access to their eastern empire by controlling the canal. The other great powers cry out in anger, specifically the French and the Ottomans. A convention in Constantinople in 1888 declares the canal to be a neutral zone in times of both war and peace. That proves to be pretty elastic though, as the Suez Canal becomes a military target in both world wars. But despite being technically a neutral zone, the canal is still pretty much British. See, Egypt is a de facto British protectorate from 1882 to 1914, though officially still an Ottoman province. After the outbreak of the Great War, Egypt becomes a real protectorate for seven years. Then in 1922, Egypt declares its independence, but British military occupation continues. In 1936, the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty of Friendship and Alliance is signed. This provides for the eventual departure of the British from Egypt, planned for 1959, but also for the first time formalizes British presence and influence in Egypt. This is because of mounting pressure from Italian Duce Benito Mussolini, who has been waging expansionist wars in Libya and Ethiopia. The treaty allows the British to maintain a standing army in the canal zone to protect Suez on behalf of Egypt and the international community. So, despite Egypt being a sovereign state on paper, and despite Egypt remaining neutral for the majority of World War II, Britain is always able to keep a significant military presence in the area, as seen on our World War II in Real Time channel. The steady onset of imperial decline after the Second World War means that the waterway loses some of this strategic value, but by 1956 it has a really vital financial value, the transport of oil. Already in 1945, the canal ships 70% of Britain's oil supply and two-thirds of that of Western Europe. Control over the canal is vital for the British, and the profit from ownership is vital for the British and the French. Much to the displeasure of a growing number of Egyptians. Though Egypt certainly benefits from the security that British military presence offers, the call for true sovereignty has grown louder and louder. The Waft Party, a nationalist liberal party, is in control of the parliament of the constitutional monarchy from 1922. Many Egyptians, including the Waft leadership, see British presence as nothing less than a foreign colonial occupation force. Many also blame Waft leadership for not boycotting the treaty. After World War II, the Egyptian government demands Britain leave Egypt altogether and the transfer of Sudan to Egypt. This does not happen, but Britain does withdraw its forces to the Canal Zone, resulting in an 80,000 troops strong British military city. The Egyptians refused to renew the 1936 treaty in 1951, listing complaints such as control over mail and communications, 
Britain's freedom without prior notice or approval to deploy in Egypt British and allied military units of any size. To assemble war material of any quantity. To use the terrain to mount campaigns against Britain's enemy. To run the economy. And, at gunpoint, to force the king into replacing a government with one of Britain's choosing, as they actually did in February 1942. But to many, King Farouk and the Vaf leadership still are not aggressive enough in securing real national sovereignty. But a new generation of Egyptian nationalists is rising. In 1952, a group of Egyptian army officers led by Mohammed Naguib and Gamal Abdel Nasser overthrow King Farouk and establishes the Republic of Egypt. Naguib becomes the first president of the new Egyptian Republic, but after a power struggle in 1954, Nasser puts him under house arrest and becomes the leader of Egypt. 34 years young, he is filled with a desire to free Egypt from British colonial rule, to win back Egypt's dignity, and to become the leader of the Arab world. Nasser is very much a product of his time and place. He grew up in Egypt in the 20s and 30s when anti-Western and anti-colonial sentiments were brewing and riots were commonplace, and he saw other parts of the British Empire gain independence. That is precisely what Nasser wants for Egypt. Egyptian guerrilla attacks on the canal base increase after the 52 coup, and with pressure from the US, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill decides to leave the canal. In July 1954, Nasser and Churchill sign a new treaty, effectively ending the British colonial control and military occupation of Egypt. The British will evacuate all of their 80,000 troops within two years, specifically by the 18th of June 1956. The Suez Canal will remain a neutral zone under the Egyptian supervision. The treaty even includes a clause that allows British military access to the Suez base if, within seven years, any Arab nation, including Turkey, is attacked by an outside power. In an interview that same year, Nasser states that he considers himself to be a friend of the West, but the treaty does significantly reduce British influence in the region. But though British soldiers are now packing up their stuff to leave the canal zone base, Egypt remains a pawn in global power games. Britain does what it can to keep a grip on the region and its supply of oil. The United States during Harry Truman's tenure as president joined that effort, though more to unionize the Arab countries in an anti-Soviet bloc than to maintain the status of a global empire. Attempts are made to rally the Arab nations for the Western cause, including a critical stance towards Israeli expansion and the sale of arms. The Western powers hold a monopoly in the arms trade in the region. But Nasser is not alone in his desire to remove Western influence. Iraq, like Egypt, does not want to renew a treaty with Britain that gives Britain liberal access to Iraqi territory. The Arab League, founded in 1944, was formed to champion Arab interests and to offer an alternative to existing alliances or empires. Nasser very much sees himself as the leader of that pan-Arab movement, but has to deal with competition from Iraq. The tension between Iraq and Egypt increases as the British and the US make a formal bloc against the Soviet Union. In 1955, the Baghdad Pact is signed between Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, and Britain with a goal of preventing communist incursions in the Middle East. Though the US is not formally involved, it attends meetings and acts as the primary arms dealer. Nasser feels threatened by the Western confirmation of Iraq as the region's Arab leader and sees this as a British plot to keep its fingers in the pie that is the Arab League. So Egypt moves away from the bloc and its members and chooses a third path, that of non-alignment. Frequent broadcasts on Radio Cairo, fervently listened to throughout the entire Arab world, call for the rejection of this British-Iraqi pact and call other Arab leaders stooges of imperialism. Distance increases between Egypt and the Western powers. But there is another conflict at play in the region, that between Israel and the Arab nations. Egypt and Israel are both wary of each other. We already cover some of this history in our Between Two Wars series, but after the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, relations between Israel and Egypt and the other Arab nations remain very, very tense. In the January 1955 foreign affairs issue, Nasser writes that 
Israel's policy is aggressive and expansionist, and Israel will continue her attempts to prevent any strengthening of the area. Israeli commando raids do expose Egypt's military vulnerability to the world. Like one February 28th that year, when Israeli troops crossed the 1949 demarcation line east and south of Gaza and killed 38 Egyptians. The UN criticizes that raid, and Nasser starts thinking that he can't be the pan-Arabian leader if he can't defend his country, so he wants to modernize his military. He turns to the US for military aid. President Dwight Eisenhower and Secretary of State John Foster Dulles say, okay, but only if the weapons are only used for defense and if American personnel provides training and supervision. That is not what Nasser wants, and he finds it somewhat patronizing. And anyhow, the US, Britain, and France have by now restricted the flow of arms to avoid an Israeli-Arab arms race. Nasser threatens to go to the Soviets instead, thinking that this might persuade the Americans. Eisenhower and Dulles figure he's bluffing and refuse. So Nasser does go to the Soviets, not for any ideological reasons, but because they are willing to sell arms to Egypt. Nasser writes, we would have preferred to deal with the West, but for us, it was a matter of life and death. The deal is a $250 million arms purchase from the Soviet Union, or rather, through intermediary Czechoslovakia. The Soviets, keen to help break the Arab unity to counter the Baghdad Pact, supply Egypt with 200 MiG-15-17 jet fighters and IL-28 jet light bombers, with scory class destroyers, motor torpedo boats, 230 medium and heavy tanks, 100 self-propelled guns, 200 APCs, and 500 artillery pieces, rocket launchers, radar, and other communications equipment. The idea of a strong Egypt, however, poses an existential threat to Israel, and Nasser himself proclaims that the weapon shipments now give him the means to wipe Israel off the map. And over the past couple of years, Egyptian-backed militants from Jordan and Egypt-controlled Gaza have been launching attacks on objectives in Israel, killing up to 260 Israelis in 1955 alone. Egypt and Syria establish a joint military command, Jordan joins in 1956. To Israel, it looks like invasion is imminent. The September 1955 arms deal seems like the straw that broke the camel's back. Though maybe the camel's back was already broken. Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion issues the order in the spring of 1956 to plan for a preemptive attack on Egypt. Other parties are also keen to be rid of Nasser and his increasing influence. See. In addition to Egypt's backing of anti-imperial voices in the Middle East and anti-Zionist militias in Jordan and Gaza, Egypt is also backing the Front de Libération Nationale, the FLN, fighting for independence from the French in Algeria, a conflict that is tearing up communities in Algeria and France. Egypt's support is seen as an insult to France by many, but Algeria is a special case in this regard. See, it is not a colony. It is a part of France. Though ordinary French people might have varying opinions on the Frenchness of it, and the question of French nationality for its native Muslim population will always be paradoxical, Algeria is, by law and custom, as French as Paris or Marseille. Nasser's support of the Algerian revolutionaries is to many an attack on French territory itself. This pushes the French and Israelis closer, and despite the agreement made to not enable an arms race in the Middle East, France starts to ship loads of arms to Israel. So Israel is already planning for war. France is sympathetic of its cause. What about the British and the Americans then? Well, the Americans are still, they think, playing a game of bluff poker with Egypt. Eisenhower and Dulles believe that Nasser is playing off the Soviets and Americans against each other. They think putting more pressure on Nasser will make him more compliant with the Western cause. Though they don't want to alienate the Egyptians too much though, since they are not really interested in a conflict in the Middle East. They want to see the region united in the fight against communism and feel that Egyptian nationalism is currently in the way of the bigger anti-Soviet cause. So hoping to increase its leverage over Egypt, on July 19, 1956, the United States, because of the arms deal between Egypt and the USSR, 
refuses to help Egypt finance the Aswan Dam project. Britain, led by current Prime Minister Antony Eden, follows suit a day later. Now, since the 1952 coup, Building the Aswan Dam has been a major priority for Naguib and Nasser and the industrialization of Egypt. It would be a huge boon for irrigation, farming and Nile flood control and would raise the standard of living for millions of Egyptians. And those two Western nations were going to support its construction with a loan of $250 million. But not now. Nasser is furious and sees this as a Western conspiracy to embarrass him domestically and regionally. Which, to be fair, for Antony Eden, who has a strong personal dislike for Nasser, it is. But Nasser does not play along. And on July 26th, he gives his Suez address and announces the nationalization of the Suez Canal, giving control to Egypt's Suez Canal Authority. He also closes the Straits of Tehran to Israel. Nasser sees himself as an example for other small nations who wish to stand up to Western imperialism, to their meddling in the Arab world, to what he sees as bullying, manipulation, and neo-colonialism. The nationalization gives him leverage over the Western powers. He still wants his dam financed. And this bold move against the global superpowers gives him prestige in the Arab world and beyond. But there are now several nations and individuals very much at odds with Egypt. The US and Britain are taken aback by the sudden seizure of the canal. To Britain, this is a huge threat to global influence and superpower status. To Eden, it's a personal affront from a man he can't stand. France doesn't like how this champion of independent Arab nations is setting an example for other colonies and even parts of France itself to rebel. And Israel has been planning a war to prevent Egypt from invading Israel first, and now also to free their access to the Straits of Tehran. These are clouds for a perfect storm gathering above the deserts of the Sinai, a storm of intrigue, intimidation, and invasion. If you would like to see how nationalism in the Middle East already gave Britain and France headaches before the Second World War, you can watch that Between Two Wars episode right here. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Sean O'Mara. It is thanks to Sean and the rest of the army that we can make new series just like this one here and on our other channels. Join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Subscribe, ring that bell thing. See you next time.